having a hard time thinking of a company that built their initial user base with market, with traditional market. Um, there are some companies that, uh, you know, the founder credibility, you know, allowed them, you know, Jig would be a good example of that. I'm not sure that as many people would be paying attention to Jig if it wasn't Joshua Schachter's startup. Um, so they have an advantage. Uh, but, but he's not spending any money on marketing other than just telling the world that this is his new thing. Yeah, um, you know, I think the Mahalo is a good example of that. I mean, Jason just can't help but tinker with that product. It's been 15 different things over the past three years. Um, and, you know, I think because he's so desperate to be successful with this thing, he's got so much of his reputation on the line that he's not patient enough. I actually think that internet marketplaces like eBay and Etsy and Kickstarter uh, and, and many, many others are large networks of engaged users. And the nice thing about those businesses is that they come with a built-in revenue model. And it's a revenue model that doesn't get in the way of a large network forming. So the thing that we like about large networks of engaged users is that they, they tend to grow, uh, uh, they tend to grow without a lot of uh, uh, extraneous kind of uh, investment and energy in them. Uh, I like to call them weeds. Um, and you know, quite a few of our large networks of engaged users, Etsy, Twitter, Tumblr, um, are companies that we have tried to kill with you know bad technology, you know some poor decisions here and there, um, maybe not the you know in some cases some bad hires here and there, and yet. They grew right through all those. I mean, think about Twitter, it was down half the time, you know, two or three years ago, and it just kept growing right through it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I guess I'd rather invest in something that's a weed um, where you have time to figure out the things that you're doing to kill the weed and stop doing them than invest in something that you need to pour a lot of fertilizer on to make it grow. Um, and, and so that's uh, why. We prefer to invest in those kinds of things. And I guess we're also convinced that most large networks of engaged users, not all, uh, will be able to be monetized. I mean, the ones that I think have been hard are um, uh, uh, things like uh, instant messaging, uh, uh, sort of private messaging. All the mobile messengers were invested in a company called Kick which is a, a private mo uh, mobile messenger. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be, if, if they got to 100 million people using Kik, I still think it's going to be challenging to figure out how do you monetize something like this. The history of AIM and ICQ and, you know, Yahoo Instant Messenger and Microsoft Instant Messenger, whatever they call that product, Microsoft <laughs> Messenger, yeah, none of them have made any money for anybody. Um, so. Uh, uh, there are some cases, I think, of, of large networks of engaged users that have been hard to monetize. But you know, looking at you know the companies in our portfolio, we're feeling pretty good about uh, the ability. Uh, if you have tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people who are engaged on a daily basis in your product, there's got to be some way to extract some value out of that. So this is slightly off topic, related to the question, but off topic from the startup, but. I've heard two respected people in the last few days say if you're an early stage startup in the consumer space, uh, you want to raise money, you have to have a business model other than advertising. Do you think it's hogwash or do you think there's truth? I don't think you need a business model. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's hogwash. Yeah, they, okay. Well, so. So we, we don't care at all about that. Um, you know, uh, other than the fact that uh, every single one of our companies that becomes moderately or hugely successful uh, ends up spending hundreds of thousands up to millions of dollars a year defending themselves from baseless patent trolls who are taxing the entire software community um, and, and frankly hurting a lot of companies in some cases causing some companies to go out of business. 
So that is, you know, very unfortunate. But we don't believe that owning a lot of patents is going to solve that problem. I mean, look, Google owns a ton of patents, and they have to go out and, and pay $12 billion, you know, for, for Motorola to get a bunch more patents. Um, so um, I don't think that intellectual property is, is, is going to protect you. It's not going to uh, make it so that you have a good business if you don't. And it's not going to be able to protect you from people trying to uh, sue you for intellectual property infringement either. Uh, so uh, it doesn't matter to us. Yeah, definitely. I think Tumblr stayed too lean too long. I mean, it didn't really hurt. So I guess in the, you know, how badly was Tumblr hurt? Not too badly. But, um, you know, they stayed too lean too long. You know, David and Marco basically built that product for, I don't know, somewhere between 12 and 24 months all by themselves. And then even after that, another year, it was three, four engineers. Um, and it just started, you know, it just got, it got beyond them. It got too big and they just didn't have the resources to, to uh, keep it up, to scale it. Uh, and then they were scrambling. Although, you know, Dick Costolo told me a long time ago when he was the CEO of Feedburner, I asked him this question. I said, would you rather make the mistake that David and Marco made or would you rather, you know, invest heavily ahead of scaling problems? He said, I'd rather be running as fast as I can trying to catch up with demand than um, sitting on a lot of excess capacity that's unused. So, uh, can't argue with David's approach there. I just think he stuck with it a little too long. So I, 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 a couple things about boards. I think smaller is better than bigger. Um, you know, the four square board is still three people. Um, and you know, I'm sure that they'll get the five not in the not too distant future, but um, smaller is better um, and because then um, you, you end up crystallizing around the answer. I mean, it's the reason that our partnership is small. I think that, uh, you know, for the first four years of our firm, it was just me and Brad, and then for the next four years, it was me and Brad and Albert, and and you know now we've got um, another partner. But um, you, I think you get to better decisions when there are fewer people at the table. Okay, so that's the first. The second thing is got to be the right fewer people around the table. It's got to be people who um, are prepared to engage deeply uh, in the business. Uh, and not just show up and pontificate. So it has to be people who will take the time to meet everybody in the company, understand what the company is trying to do, use the company's products, uh, have some expertise in the company's markets, uh, have been around long enough to have some, you know, credibility in terms of, you know, what they say and, and some insight into what's going on. Um, and so, you know, getting the right group of people, and I don't believe in trophy board members. I don't believe in uh, putting people on the board because um, they have a bunch of money in your company, although sometimes you might be forced to do that. Um, I think those are bad reasons to put people on boards. So in terms of around practices, uh, I totally agree with you. Board meetings should not be for reporting. You should send out a report in advance of the board meeting uh, and tell the board what's going on in the business. Um, so when they come to the meeting, they know as much as you knew, ideally. They won't know as much as you do, but as much as they can know. Um, and then I think you need to put the two or three big strategic issues that uh, the company is facing on the table, and you need to hash them out. And it should be like, um, it should be a lot like what the management team does, you know, on a regular basis um, in terms of really you know, debating, discussing, you know, pushing each other, you know, people playing devil's advocates, and just trying to get, you know, uh, collective, uh, you know, kind of eye on the business. And they don't have to, and they don't, and the other thing about board meetings is they don't have to come out with resolutions. They don't have to come out with answers. I think um, as long as they are, you know, kind of really good, uh, um, kind of exhaustive, uh, uh, discussions of what's going on in the business, the management team should be able to walk out of that um, with enough kind of uh, uh, 
uh, data and inspiration and feedback that they can make the right decisions. The boards also should not be making the decisions. They should just be, you know, kind of creating enough, you know, intellectual agitation uh, with the management team so that the management team uh, comes to the right decisions. You know, I, I think that um, what you what you really want is everybody in the company to understand uh, lean and 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 be able to kind of uh, apply it to everything that the company does, not just the exercise around building product, but also how you go about hiring, how you go about. Uh, uh, your finances, everything uh, about the business, and uh, and so if you could just if you could just take uh, the, I'd sort of the, the key central tenets of the lean methodology and and just make sure that the company kind of walks the walk across everything they do, then you become a company that uh, uh, is really um, embodies you know in every way the the benefits of the, of it and. And then it has to come from the top. Uh, so the founder and CEO has to um, lead that and, and really make people understand why it's important. Um, but I, I, I don't think like just having a, a, you know, a, a process, okay, this is how we're gonna launch a product and we're gonna do these 10 steps, is, is that, uh, uh, is, 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 is that much of a change. Um, but if you, could, if you could really embrace it across everything the company does, I think it's, it's truly transformative. Well, you know, I didn't think of it as lean, right? But the last venture capital firm I had, um, uh, we had 25 people, you know, we um, were, uh, you know, doing lots of things that, you know, I, you know, in hindsight, didn't make a lot of sense. And uh, when uh, my partner Brad and I sat down and kind of architected Union Square Ventures, um, I said, "Look, you know, I never want to have more than three or four partners. I want to work out of one office. I don't want to have a staff of more than eight or ten people. I want to do all our work ourselves. I don't want to hire any consultants. I don't want to spend any money on on research or anything like that." If if we make an investment decision, then we're making it based on our own proprietary research, our own proprietary insights. I want to, you know, we, we always meet with the management teams together. You know, we, you know, it's like this whole, this sort of was a reaction to all the things that I felt we had done wrong in the prior firm. And, you know, sitting here today and looking back, and that was a conversation I had in 2003, um, sitting back and looking that, you know, a lot of those things in my mind are, uh, the lean way to do venture capital. We don't raise large fund sizes. Um, uh, we, uh, we don't have we don't have a big administrative staff. We actually outsource our administrative staff. I mean, our, our financial uh, mm -hmm. operations. We outsource that. Um, we have one one person. We have one admin across the entire organization. You know. Um, so we just we do a lot of we do a lot of stuff ourselves. You know, I take the garbage out. Like you know, it's just it's just a, it's 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 a cultural thing, right? Um, and and it's just been fantastic for us. I think we, it's, you know, there's very few people who work at Unisquare Ventures, but the people we have are terrific. Um, someone says to me, when you, when you have a software engineering team, if you had a software engineering team of five world-class, incredible software engineers, they could do more than a team of 50 mediocre software engineers. And I kind of feel like that's what we try to create at Unisquare Ventures. We have a small team. But everybody is fantastic at what they do, and I think as a result, you know, we, you know, somebody who wouldn't know what our office looked like might think that you know we were as big as some of the firms we compete with, but we're not anywhere close to as big as the firms we compete with. And I think all of that is kind of lean. Um, 